we're very happy today to um, welcome Will Dean. And Will grew up in the East Midlands and had lived in nine different villages before the age of 18. His debut novel, Dark Pines, was selected for a Zoe Ball Book Club, shortlisted for a Guardian Not the Booker Prize, and named a Daily Telegraph Book of the Year. He has received many accolades, and I fully expect that his latest novel will be taking next year's awards by storm. Will uh, lives in Sweden, where the um, Tuva Moodison novels are set. Will, welcome to Thriller Talk. Thank you very much. It's, it's good to be with you both. Well, we're excited to have you here. So the first question comes at you. I've always felt um, that more characters in crime fiction should have disabilities to reflect real life. Um, and what led you to make Tuva deaf? And was there anything that you learned during your research that really surprised you about, you know, living uh, in that way? That's a great question. Yeah, with, with Tuva Moodison, uh, the protagonist in my Swedish series, which is kind of like Twin, Twin Peaks, but a series of novels. Uh, it's like a claustrophobic small town mysteries. Um, I kind of saw her, she came as a thunderbolt, fully formed as a character. So I, I'm a very visual writer. So I saw this vast forest, much bigger than the one I live in in Sweden. And I zoomed in in my mind's eye, I saw a, a road snaking through the trees. And I zoomed in, I saw a big pickup truck. And I looked through the window and I saw a young woman driving this huge pickup truck and she had hearing aids. And I wanted to know where she was driving to, where she was driving from, what her story was. And yeah, I came to understand very quickly, you know, about her, a little bit about her deafness. And I did a lot of research into that. I did about six months research into that before I even started writing her, in fact. And I think like consciously, I don't decide which character to write or even which story to write. It's just something that just kind of falls into my head at some point and I run with it and, and I'm interested in it and I'm curious about it. But I think subconsciously, I probably had recognized over the years like I have a few deaf and hard of hearing friends and I never see deaf and hard of hearing characters on tv and movies and books or very seldom and that's probably where that came from um and now I'm writing the fifth one the fifth Tuva Moody song book and I still don't really understand her yet and I think that's what fuels me through the series is I'm trying to get to know her I'm trying to understand her and uh, they're great fun to write because they're quite Stephen King-esque and they're very kind of dark, but with a lot of humor and friendship mixed in there as well. Well, I read a fascinating article about you in um, The Guardian where you mentioned that the whole story for The Last Thing to Burn came to you between midnight and 6 a.m., which is fascinating to me. Like, it's also kind of not fair, I think, for a lot of writers out there uh, that really wish a book would just come to them in the middle of the night too. So can you just touch on that a little bit? What's that experience like? And then how do you take that idea and turn it into a full-fledged novel? Okay, well, first of all, Ryan, I've got to say that's the first and last time that's ever happened to me. So it's not like <laughs> something that happens with this book. It was a freak occurrence, but yeah, I was lying there. This was 2016. My wife was asleep, midnight, in that great time, that really rich time between wakefulness and sleep. And suddenly I had, again, an image in my head, and it was this completely flat landscape and a tiny two-bedroom cottage on this very isolated farm. And I saw a woman from an aerial perspective walking around this cottage and in and out, but she never went very far away. And I wanted to understand what was holding her back. And I came to understand between midnight and 6 a.m. that she was being held captive on this farm. And there was no one in the area to help her. And yeah, that was a weird one because I just kind of, you know, often I have an idea or a seed for an idea and then I'll write a note and then I'll fall asleep an hour later. And in the morning, the note makes no sense whatsoever. It's just complete garbage. Whereas with this, I went with it. So at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., I was still lying there with my, you know, eyes open, eyes closed, making notes on my phone. And by 6 a.m., yeah, I had the whole arc of the story and one thing is one thing that helped me is the story is very simple it's mainly two characters it's all set in one place it's a very claustrophobic tense story but it's not very complex and sometimes I prefer that because I can go really deep then into character and I think that's where readers get invested if they really feel for a character and then that character's in jeopardy that's the most gripping thing there is I think. 
Absolutely. So when you started Lasting to Burn, did you think long and hard about which point of view to use? Because I found it very, very like productive and just really engaging to have the first person because you feel incredibly close. Also, I noticed that when you made the reveals, it was so well done because you couldn't find that information out by anyone else, right? Through anybody, other characters. So I'd love to hear you talk just about that process. Yeah, that's something as well, which just comes organically. Like when, I, when I'm in the weeks leading up to starting a first draft, I have this really unhealthy process where I have an idea, then I have like maybe half a year thinking about the idea, researching, and then I'll know I'm about to start a first draft. You know, I clear my diary of anything, any publicity stuff, I don't travel. And then I write a first draft in three weeks, three or four weeks. So last thing to burn was three weeks. Really like, don't, I don't recommend this process to anyone. <laughs> um, but it it's it's the only way I can do it I'm terrified to change it now sure. and in those weeks leading up to uh, starting the first draft I kind of understand then how I'm going to write it like which point of view and if it's going to be first person or third I start to think those things through and the answer just always comes to me it's not like I I go over the pros and cons it's more like I when I was in that cottage um watching observing i was kind of looking through her eyes i was seeing len this monstrous farmer this antagonist this the worst character i will ever write in my life i was watching him through her eyes so i understood i needed to write it from her perspective well it certainly i felt made the reveals very powerful because you know you're reading along and you're you're not perfectly sure and then all of a sudden there's something like that makes more sense and i just thought that was a really brilliant way to do it and also the surprises that come along later in the book which of course no spoilers allowed um are perfectly set up by that level so when you with respect to the point of view and also the the plotting so is that just do you literally plot it out in your mind before the three weeks go you do it yeah I'm terrible at plotting it's the, it's the the weakest thing for me is plotting I find it really hard because as a reader you know I'm a I'm a voracious reader and I don't really care about plot that much like I do care about it it's important but it's not the first or second or third thing I'm looking for when I'm reading or when I'm writing, I'm all about the characters and the landscape and the relationships between the characters. And then the plot is important, but it's kind of secondary for me. And I'm not good at it. I'm not naturally good at it at all. So, so that comes, like, I understand the story. And this is something I've wrestled with for years. It's like the difference between plot and story, but there is a difference. And that night in 2016, I had the whole story. I certainly didn't have the whole plot. That takes me much longer when I'm rewriting, I come up with the plot. And I, al I always say I'm not a very intellectual writer at all. I don't write really with my head, I write with my gut. So I feel my way through a book. I want to be really moved. I want to be emotional in, in different ways, in different parts of a book. And I want to almost go in like, like a kid, you know, like if, if I see my seven-year-old writing a little story about spiders or something he's not thinking what will other people think about this story and what will they think about me writing this story he just thinks you know he gets in there and it's all about what whatever he's kind of dreaming up in that moment and that's what I try and return to I try and put myself in a place where I'm not thinking what my editor is going to think about this or readers or awards judges no that's all very distant from that process it's just about me being a kid again and writing the story that's bursting out of me and then the like I said the plotting the mechanical stuff the smart stuff that other writers are much better at than I am that comes later on when I'm rewriting and I have to do a lot of rewriting so like this book The Last Thing to Burn took three weeks to write the first draft but it took me five years to finish the book so I'm really fast and really slow at the same time <laughs> <laughs> I love that amazing and by the way, no, you're not terrible at plotting. You're 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 really not. You're great at plotting. It might not come naturally uh, as easily to you as as you'd like. But I will, as reading your work, you definitely are really good at it. I will say that. Um, I also read, by the way, in the Guardian uh, that you have a place in the woods. And I know we talked about this in the in the pre-interview. So I want to ask you on the record: you built this place yourself? Is that true? And and. What is it about the wilderness, the outdoors, that sort of um, you're called to? 
Yeah, so I was brought up in, in the Midlands of the UK, kind of where the last thing to burn is set. Very rural, kind of the equivalent of Iowa or somewhere like that, maybe. Very agricultural. And uh, I like nature. I like headspace and silence very much. I like just hanging out with my dog. That's what I was like as a kid. I was, as a kid, I was shy and socially awkward. I was hanging out with my dog and I was reading a lot of stories. That's basically still what I'm like now. So when I was 18, I moved down to London. I was the first kid in my family to ever like stay in school past 16 or go to university. They all thought I was a freak for wanting to study and leave the town, leave this small town. And then I stayed in London for 15 years. You know, London is kind of like New York. It's just crazy expensive. So we lived in a little one bedroom apartment, tiny one. And after 15 years, like it would have taken another 10 years or something. So my wife, who is Swedish, and I changed our life around a little bit. So we had a like that, and we ended up buying a or finding a plot of land in a forest in Sweden. It's like three and a half acres of swamp land in a big pine forest, kind of like main landscape. You know, there's a lot of moose here. There's thousands of moose here. There's wolves further north. There are bears. And we bought this boggy piece of land. And I was extremely excited about this project. I'm quite handy. I like building and fixing things. So I knew I could like do a lot of the work myself, but not all of it. I'm not technically good enough to do plumbing and electrics, but I can do all the carpentry and a lot of the groundwork. So we found it on Christmas Day on the internet. It was cheap because no Swedes were crazy enough to try to live this way. Uh, like their grandparents lived this way and it was tough. So they didn't want to live here. So we moved in and we had no water no toilet like the toilet was a hut 50 yards away in the woods and when it's kind of minus 25 in winter we were just like trek there and quickly and then trek back again and and there was the the well was like a hand pump thing and it was back then it was tough when we were in that stage of the process but we've been here 10 years now and like it's like a normal almost like a normal house so we have a lot of uh issues with water the water is brown <laughs> it tastes of screws and iron and stuff but that's quite common and uh, we still have a lot of moose but now we have a big saint bernard he keeps them away a little bit um but yeah we live a very quiet low cost simple old-fashioned off-grid or semi off-grid semi self-sufficient life we grow a lot of our own food we use our own uh wood for heating and cooking so it's good and how did your wife, was she like completely open to that or was she the one pushing for it or versus you? I'm curious. I mean, my wife is very cool. She's a lot cooler than I am. So she she's only ever lived in cities uh, her whole life. She was like, how are we going to live in a forest? There's no store. There's no town. There's no. There's not even a road. Like when we bought this place, or when we came to see it for the first time, we flew in. The real estate agent picked us up from the airport because he was so shocked anybody wanted to buy this swamp. And he drove us here and he could only drive like five kilometers away, five miles away. He stopped his Volvo. We had to hike the rest of the way. He was like, there's no road. You, I can't drive you there. And when we found it, when we saw it for the first time, I was like, I want to live here. This is this place. This land has good soul. This is where I want to live. I just want to raise my children. And my wife was like, here's the deal. You build something. We'll build something together. If I don't like it living here after six months if i'm terrified of the noise of nature and the the fact that it's freezing cold and there's nobody here to help us if there's a problem there's no fire truck that can get up our road or anything like that if i don't like it after six months we sell it no arguments we sell it we move to a town like normal people and i said yeah deal that's fine and like 10 years later she probably likes it here even more than i do so i got lucky i guess that's that's quite a great story i love it so um, speaking of, you know, being stuck in nowhere um, with respect to uh, the story, um, setting it was sensationally claustrophobic in The Last Thing to Burn. I love the fact that it, you know, it actually be a perfect movie because, you know, you always worry with movies about having to, you know, invest in a lot of different locations and everything. And this would be just like in one spot. But when you make, you know, the entire novel take place basically, you know, in one um, room, you know, kind of house, it 
it's tough because you have a lot of pressure on you with respect to the setting. How did you go about making this setting so evocative? Uh, good question. A lot of it is is the fact that I'm very familiar with that kind of setting, that kind of cottage, that kind of farm landscape, because it's where I'm from. So I, I kind of, I get those really badly built little houses where the bathroom's kind of been bolted on as an afterthought and it's built onto mud and it's cold and damp all of the time. I, I know what that, that's like. And then I spend a lot of time before I start writing, before I start typing, I spend a lot of of the time in my in my imagination basically walking around the cottage so I want to know what the floors sound like I want to know what the staircase feels like you know when you've got no shoes on I want to know what it's like in the winter time with that Rayburn stove really hot and I want to know what it's like in the summertime and I just I just spend a lot of time thinking I think thinking is something that's really underrated as part of the writing um process and a lot of us who produce a book a year it's difficult to have enough time to do an adequate amount of thinking Maybe that's why this book took five years, because I took my time thinking and daydreaming to get that atmosphere and that feel right. But yeah, I spend a lot of time in my imagination walking around that house and just trying to get a sense of what it would, what it would be like for her. Mm-hmm. And the, the book has been likened to Misery by Stephen King and Room by Emma Donoghue. And they're two books that I admire, two authors I admire a lot. And uh, in a way, this, were, this book is worse because with those books, the protagonist can't really see safety in the distance. Whereas with The Last Thing to Burn, the landscape is so flat and she's not you know, chained up or anything like that. She's free to walk in and out and around the cottage. She can always see safety. She can see churches in the distance on the horizon. She can see traffic on the roads and she can never get there. It's always out of reach. And I thought that would be particularly kind of horrific. I I agree, by the way. Um, Well, of of the books that you've written, is there one that stands out to you that was the most challenging to complete? Was it, was it this one? I mean, this one took five years, right? So. They're all, they're all so challenging. I find the, I find this very Morris and addictive writing. I, I I have slightly too many ideas per year and I, I, I love the buzz I get from a first draft. Like those, I write like one or two first drafts a year, three or four weeks each time. And they are my favorite weeks of the whole year. I'm kind of high when I'm, I'm kind of in the, I don't know, a fugue state, like a fever dream when I'm writing the first draft. The rest of the process, all of those months and years of rewriting is not like that. It's very businesslike and normal and sitting down at my desk and, you know, like it is for all of us, just kind of working. But the first draft is something special and it's terrifying and challenging and wonderful. It's the closest, like I was saying, to being a kid again and not being aware of what you're doing and not like worrying too much about the real life consequences consequences of what you're doing. In terms of which book is most challenging, I find them all challenging in different ways. That Often I'll get tripped up by something in each book and it'll take me a while to figure out a particular character. It often takes me a long time to work out what the story is actually about, you know, because you know what the story is about on the surface, but to get deep into the story and understand like the essence of the story that takes me months and months and months but this one was particularly challenging because it's so tense and it's the first time I've had a knot in my stomach writing a story the whole way through that first draft I was really anxious for her to get away and to survive and to thrive to get away from this man and to overcome him and that was in a, in a kind of a visceral way quite exhausting quite challenging i wanted i wanted to get to the end of it so so that i understood the end of it yeah i i agree with you and going back to what you said just a couple minutes ago about how you know jane stuck there but you know most you know hostages are manacled or you know tied to something and i i just you know obviously her foot was a major issue um but also but, but it was just the like you said, being held hostage without any boundaries is, I think, doubly difficult. Um, I've been studying kidnap and ransom actually for my novels for the last six years, really deeply involved in that world. And human tra- trafficking, of course, you know, basically dovetails with that. And I wondered, you know, given your deep dive into human trafficking, if you have any thoughts about 
how you know the world can address this issue? Wow, I mean that's a big question. I just I just see it as this enormous heinous ongoing crime that does not get enough attention because the victims of the crime don't get enough attention. Mm -hmm. And it's often talked about in kind of high level intellectual political terms and we don't often think about it on a just a human level. How does it impact one person? And I think that's hopefully where, you know, your writing and my writing can help a little bit shine a light because it's, it's, it's relatable if it's one character. If it's one person and you stay with them for a little while, you can understand some of the potential consequences of crimes like these. <clears throat> but um, my research was quite shocking for me, really, to, to, to kind of, because you get a glimpse into it from news headlines and news stories and editorials. But once you start lifting the lid on it, you just realize how much of a massive, complex issue it is and how difficult it is to, to defeat it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, it's, it's, it's terrifying to know that this kind of thing is going on in a million different ways right now as we're talking in comparative safety and security, there are people in a similar situation to the protagonist in The Last Thing to Burn. I mean, it's 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 horrific to think about. Yeah, and what really shocks me too is that with human trafficking, even places like I live in Canada, and it's a relatively safe country, but human trafficking is, you know, right here. I mean, it's a really big issue. And that's what I think is really scary because it's sort of like, Sometimes you think of things as distance. For example, kidnapping feels a little bit more distance because generally it takes place, you know, in international locales that are very dicey, you know, and, there, and there's that aspect. But I think human trafficking is a whole other level of, of, I don't know, just in incredibly terrifying because like you said, it's everywhere and it's insidious. Exactly that. It's a real hidden crime. Like this could have been going on, well, this, this was going on in the story on this farm for years and years and years. And like his neighbors think he's a nice guy. Mm -hmm. His neighbors, uh, he's a mate of theirs. And that, that's terrifying. When I was living in London, I lived in uh, quite a shady area, but close by there was a nice area. And there were a lot of like domestic workers, you know, working there. And I used to pass by and see, see these workers and think, you know, are they being are you being treated okay? Are you being treated well? Are you do you have access to your passport? Do you have options? You know, are you getting paid the way you should be getting paid? Is this what you agree to? You know, are you are you um are you living in terms of your own free will? Are you able to make decisions here? And uh, it is scary to think that some of those situations are not good. Heart wrenching. And I think that there's a lot of work to be done, just like with kidnapping too. As long as there is going to be um, enough, what they consider a commodity, you know, humans, that someone wants to pay to get back, it's going to keep perpetuating. And the only thing that really stops it is prosecution. Um, that's why it's, you know, not big in, you know, the US and Canada because there's such heavy prosecution. But with human trafficking, it's really hard because there's so many different layers. So I thank you for sharing that. It's very fascinating. Yeah, and so well, I'll ask you about your... Yeah, layers. Sorry. Go ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, you, the authorities perhaps think they're making progress on a particular front, in a particular way, and then there's a new conflict somewhere. And then there's a whole new opportunity for the, for the bad guys to start trafficking people and exploiting people and exploiting a new group of people. It's just a never-ending crisis. And it's, it's something that I think should be... Um, there should be more research resources put into trying to cut it off, trying to stop it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, I'll ask you about your your next project or what you're currently working on in a minute. But um, I can't help but wonder. So, when someone is as critically acclaimed as uh, the last thing to burn, which has earned rave reviews from every pre-publication trade review site out there, and is adored by fans, is there? pressure to somehow top yourself so like do you ever think about that or worry about that uh does that drive you to continue to grow as a writer or do you just block all that out when you're writing i mean i leave that to my agent to worry about and my editor you know because <laughs> <laughs> i think i would i would 
I would lose all, all confidence if I started thinking that way. Like maybe when I'm in London or I'm in, I'm in New York and I'm in meetings, I start to think about it a little bit. But honestly, when I'm here in the woods, I have so much natural distance from it. And I've done that on purpose. I don't want to think about publishing. I don't want to think about awards and sales and all that stuff. When I'm, when I'm home with my family, I want to be around the bonfire with my kid. I want to be just a normal dad and, and my work is my work. And I want to focus on the storytelling and the language. And I want to sit here and read a lot and learn from those authors who are much better than I am at what we do. So no, I uh, honestly, I don't feel a lot of pressure to make the next book better in some way. I mean, I feel pressure to write a book that I'm proud of and I like. Sure. And I feel pressure to get out of my comfort zone with every book and push myself a little bit. But that's like an internal pressure. You know, I want to I wanna work on my craft and I see it as a very long-term thing. Like if I write the best book of my life in 30 years time, great. You know, I'm not in any rush to write, to, 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 win some huge thing in five years time no it's it's like i'm very inspired by cormac mccarthy who hides away in the santa fe institute and he i think he had like a very long-term vision for his writing improving and it has done you can read it book after book gets a little better and then when he was however old he was in his 70s he wrote the road which for me is like it's my favorite novel it's an incredible book and i'm inspired by that you know there's no rush and the way I'm going to get there is by reading. Well said. And I really respect your dedication to your craft. It's excellent already. I, I can't imagine it getting better, but I look forward to it. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and I also, I'm a craft junkie too. I, I just think it, it, it's, I look at writing as a journey, right? And you just want to go on that journey and learn what you can when you're ready to. And then from there, you know, hopefully you'll grow. Exactly. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Stephen King's on writing. Yes. Yeah. And I read that book. Yeah, I read that book like once a year, once every 18 months. And it gives me this surge of, of I don't know, confidence, hope that I can do this and I can continue to do this. And I love his enthusiasm and his generosity as a writer through that book. And, you know, he, he told me, told me, he kind of said through the book, like, don't do this in a half-hearted way. Get rid of your TV if you need to. And for four years before I signed with my agent, for four years when I was trying to write and failing or not doing it well enough, I got rid of my TV for four years. Wow. We didn't watch anything for four years because I wanted to kind of double up the amount of reading I was doing. So, yeah, I think, I think that is everything, kind of hiding yourself away from the commercial pressures while you're writing and just being that childish storyteller again and trying to move yourself emotionally trying to shock yourself trying to make yourself tense that because you're the first i'm the first reader of my own story so i want i want to be excited by my own work if that's possible that's great and so when it comes to having books delivered at your beautiful cabin how does that work <laughs> i just have to ask that's a good question so i have a post box <laughs> on a stick on a, on a on a piece of wood and it's like uh, two kilometers away that's as close as the post guy can come in his truck in his like four wheel drive. So he puts my proofs. I get about 10 proofs sent arcs sent here a week and I get them stuffed into that box and I hike through the woods with my St. Bernard. Um, and we pick up the, the books and if there's too many, then he will take them back away with him again or just leave them in the snow or whatever. And, uh, it works fine. It gives me some exercise and, um, yeah, that's as close as people can get here. So that's quite nice. Wow, that's incredible. I love it. So how many hours a day would you spend reading then? It varies a lot. I'm a big fan of audiobooks. Okay. So when I'm driving, I've always got an audiobook on. When I'm, not so much when I'm chopping wood, but maybe when I'm stacking wood, I'll always have an audiobook on. Right now I'm reading Rosemary's Baby by Ira Levin for the first time. It's like a horrible, brilliant book, horrible and brilliant. And it's really kind of blowing my mind. It's one of those books, you know, if I read 100 books a year, one or two will really grab me. And that, that's one of them. So I'm really enjoying it. I'm trying to slow it down. I don't want to rush it. Um, and I read, yeah, physical books, you know, before bed and stuff or half an hour at lunchtime. But I just get so much pleasure out of it. 
Couldn't agree more. I think it's the best escape there is in the world, much better than TV. So my understanding is you're a recovering lawyer. Is that correct? Right. <laughs> not, not, not really. I kind of, I never, I never got that far. So I studied law. Yes. At, at the university, partly because my family were like, "You're going to go to university. You're going to study something that leads directly to a job." Because I want to study history or something. They were like, "No." And uh, but after I finished, I didn't want to be a lawyer. I didn't want to be in an office all day long. I, w I wanted to be outdoors. So in, I did a lot of strange jobs. I worked construction. I worked um, outdoors on the streets of London, selling discount haircut coupons to strangers for two years, commission only, like six days a week, terrible job, but I did that. And in a way that was a terrible career move, but it did enable me to see a lot of people and talk to a lot of strangers and hear a lot of stories. So I think it was good. I'm drawing upon that now, it helps me now. And then in the end, I worked in technology and, and um, infrastructure designing trading systems like designing like eBay uh, auction infrastructure for bond markets. I did that for eight years and then we moved here. So I had a lot of weird jobs, but I kind of, and I didn't know I was going to be a writer. I'm not one of those writers who knew when they were five, they were going to be a writer. I didn't think that was an option available to someone like me at all. So I was just a reader until I was in my mid thirties. And then I, then I realized I'm going to write a story and see how it goes. Well, it seems to have worked out really well. I would say so. Yeah, I think it all worked. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of luck involved, you know, the stars kind of align and my gratitude goes out to the whole team around me, really. And also all of those authors who have written those stories before, because that's who I've learned from. Uh, right now, it's Ira Levin, but it's, you know, so many authors that I, you know, it's, whether it's Stephen King or Yar Jassy or Shirley Jackson or Cormac McCarthy, I'm just in debt to them because they, they taught me. Well, Will, before we, uh, before we let you go, uh, what's next for you? You know, can you tell us anything about your current writing project and when might readers expect the next book? Yeah, so the second standalone novel will be out next spring in the US and Canada. I can't tell you the title yet. I wish I could. But it's a, a wild story set in New York. And it's about sibling relationships and revenge. And it is, it is, uh, it was a right, it was a real roller coaster to write the novel. And uh, I'm really excited to hear people's thoughts of it. It's, yeah, it's, it's the twistiest thing I've ever written. And it was great fun to write. And that, that will be out next spring. Well, we're looking forward to it, man. I mean, we can't wait to read it. And, uh, I mean, you could tell us the title if you if you want it. We won't tell <laughs> for everyone who wants it. I have to. No, it's okay. But uh, no, we're excited, man. We can't wait to look for that next spring. And thank you so much for coming on. I mean, this was fascinating. I know, like, like Kim, I'm I'm fascinated both by uh, your your path to becoming a writer and and but even the living outdoors and how all that works together, man. I mean, seriously, probably one of the most interesting people that we've talked to so far on all this. And um, I'm, I'm riveted by not just your work, but by you. So I can't wait for the next one. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for having me on. It's been lovely talking to you. And I can't wait to get to the US, hopefully meet you guys in person yeah. at events. And uh, we can chat, chat more. Definitely. Really look forward to that. Thanks a lot for joining us today, Will. Thank you very much.